All right, how's everyone doing today? Good. So, uh, my name is uh, Chris Bear. I uh, currently teach uh, EMS and uh, Allied Health uh, Sciences at uh, Doñana Community College, We're part of the New Mexico State University of New York's Cruces. So, I teach primarily for the uh, EMS program and uh, for the respiratory therapy program here as well. So I'm actually uh, uh, doing uh, graduate work uh, at the University of Florida in clinical toxicology right now. So this is something that is uh, interesting to me. And I think in light of uh, kind of what's going on in contemporary times, uh, particularly in uh, a place like Syria, uh, this is certainly something worthy of talking about. And I kind of wanted to depart just a little bit from the standard uh, nerve agent uh, talks that, that we often, that we're often given when we talk about uh, Sludge, basically, what do we get? We get sludge, give the uh, atropine, give the toucan, and uh, we'll take a test on it, and that's that. So what I really want to do is I really want to dig in and, and talk about the, the toxicology and the history of these agents, because the, there are a lot, a lot of interesting misconceptions, particularly in the, in the public, and you have, the, of course, that's, that's really helped by move with, uh, some of the movies out there, like The Rock, has anyone ever seen that? Or, they get exposed to the nerve agent and their face falls off and it's, it's just really dramatic. Um, but I really want to talk about how these things work. So here I have the uh, kind of the, the cover slide here. And if some of you look at that, you might go, hey, it looks kind of like a neuromuscular junction there. And um, this is actually really telling because this is where uh, we're most concerned about the nerve agents and their mechanism of action and their toxicities. So we'll go ahead and get started. So the objectives that I want to do in the next hour is I want to talk about the uh, historical context. Um, apparently, it wants to connect to the internet. So let's just cancel that and uh, continue. We don't need to connect the internet. All right. So we want to talk about the historical context of how these, these things came about, how they're developed. They've actually been around for much longer than you might think. I want to talk about the basic toxicological profile of some of these agents. It's fascinating, actually. It's really fascinating with some of the stuff we run into. Um, I want to talk about the current treatment modalities. Uh, you'll be surprised, actually. You'll be surprised how we end up having to treat some of these, these overdoses, um, some of these toxicities. I mean, you'll be surprised just how significant uh, the incidence and, and the prevalence of exposure is worldwide when you look outside the United States. And then we're going to talk about the immediate long-term consequences, and believe it or not, there are some pretty significant long-term consequences that, that result in patients uh, when we follow the prudent disposition. Okay, so are nerve agents really a problem? This is an interesting thought. When I, uh, when I joined the Army uh, back, in the, uh, back in the 90s, uh, I was a medic. And we're going to talk about nerve agents, and we're just coming out of um, the Gulf War, and guess what happened in the Gulf War? Well, there were really significant nerve agent uh, casualties that, that occurred there. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Gulf War syndrome and how that actually may, um, may in part be explained by some exposures. But nothing particularly significant happened. Uh, so when I was going through school, I was kind of like, well, why are we learning about this stuff? How is this relevant? This, this, is, this is stuff that, that Germans thought of in the 30s and 40s. It's not really relevant. So let's talk about how relevant this is. When we look at the, uh, the world, globally, nerve agents probably kill more people toxicologically than any other class of agent known, which is pretty surprising. There are over 3 million exposures to nerve agents every year worldwide. Over 3 million. This is reported, of course. Um, I'm using, I think, 2008 2009 data. So I'm not sure what the, the most contemporary day of the show. Uh, approximately 200,000 people a year die, not around the world, but in Asia, in rural Asian countries like India, as kind of a part of it. 200,000 people die from the radiation exposure around the world, where suicide by these agents is exceptionally common. So the third world grunts a lot of the uh, consequences of these nerve agents. Um, these these, of course, are the insecticides, and they're very easy to get a hold of in some of these countries. And um, if you guys, you, most of you guys work in EMS, you know what people tend to overdose on. 
they tend to overdose on things that are really easy to get a hold of. So we see a lot of acetaminophen or Tylenol, we see a lot of aspirin, we see a lot of inset toxicities that come, come into the ER that, that use EMS services because those agents happen to be available. Well, these agents are quite available around the world, um, not as much in the United States because there's a fairly significant regulation when it comes to some of these really potent agents. Um, when we look at the United States, there are about 3,000 exposures. And if included in there, I include pharmaceuticals, uh, like agents for glaucoma and agents for Alzheimer's disease um, that can have uh, some uh, nerve or nerve agent like um, activity. Okay, and nerve agents can be used in modern terrorist attacks and, uh, of course, on the battlefield to stun them back. Okay, so we begin. So we'll talk a little bit about the history. Um, the literature goes back as far as the mid, mid to late 1800s. Uh, people thought talking about uh, these about people coming into contact with these agents and having signs and symptoms that are highly suggestive of what's known as a cholinergic uh, toxidrome, something we'll talk about here a little bit. So possibly, uh, going back quite, quite a ways actually, um, the, the contemporary history of these uses of weapons really goes back to about the 1930s. And it was the German scientists who were reporting these adverse effects, people that were exposed to these, these insecticides that they were developing. And of course they thought, well, shoot, maybe we can weaponize these, maybe we can refine them and make them relevant on the battlefield. Um, and that's exactly what happened. So this is right, this is in between um, World War One. World War One had ended, World War Two was just getting ready to get started, and then by the end of World War Two um, is when the Germans have really developed the prototype nerve agents. So, so from the 30s all the 40s. Um, in 1936, uh, Tabu was discovered, and in 1938, Sarin was discovered, which is something relevant because everybody's talking about that. Because it looks like it was what was used in Syria. I don't know why. There's something wrong with this room, I guess. Huh? Yeah, there's, there's some some sort of. Uh, I don't know. I, I didn't think I'd have that turned off. That's all right. At least at least it shows up. So. All right. Uh, and then by by the mid '40s, so toward the end of uh, World War II, uh, Solman was discovered. So Germans are actively developing herb agents while World War II is going on. Um, interestingly enough, the Geneva Protocol of 1925 actually banned chemical weapons use, but that certainly didn't stop anybody from developing these. Okay. So what happened? Well, by the 1950s, we had a British company. They turned over research of a, of a new highly effective agent. And this agent was a category of agents known as the V category. And you guys are quite familiar with the term VX. Um, it was on movies like, like The Rock. The VX was a really bad one. The Russians experimented extensively with these V agents in the 60s, all the way up to the 90s. Um, during the 1960s, the use was officially banned. Uh, by the United States. However, we did actively develop these agents on until about the mid 60s. Um, so that's that. That's kind of the general basic history. Um, I should say that the United States, we still have thousands and thousands of, of pounds of these agents in stockpiles. Even though we're not actively developing them, we still have munitions going back as far as back as the 1950s. We have chemical munitions that are, that are sitting in several stockpiles throughout. Okay, so let's talk about the general classification of these agents. I find this fascinating. Um, and it, it is morbidly fascinating, definitely, but it's still fascinating nonetheless. So we have two broad categories of agents. We have what are called the organic phosphorus agents, and we have what are called the carbamates. Uh, before I go any further, this is a, um, I'm, I'm kind of a chemistry buff. I really enjoy chemistry. Um, so you guys have probably heard the term organophosphate. Has anyone heard that organophosphate? I despise that term. I hate it. Okay, I hate it. Don't don't use it. It's bad. Um, it's nitpicking is what it is. But when we look, and we'll look at the chemistry of these. When we look at uh, when I say in chemical in chemical lingo, when I say phosphate, what I mean is a phosphorus atom that has been bound by four oxygen atoms. That's a phosphate. Um, that's not what we see in many of these nerve agents. We do see a phosphorus molecule, or atom rather, um, and it may have some oxygens bound to it, but it has some other atoms bound to it. Um, and it may not be four oxygens, 
So I prefer the term organic phosphorus or organophosphorus. That's, that's a bit more kosher in terms of the chemistry. Um, so yeah, there we go. So here's just a general, this is the, the active part of our organic phosphorus agent. Uh, we have a phosphorus atom in the middle. That atom is usually bound to a double, uh, double uh, covalent bond to um, oxygen. Uh, sometimes it can be fluorine. It could be one, any of the halides uh, like that. Uh, sometimes sulfur. We'll talk about that. Why that's important. Um, and then you have these different groups that come off that phosphorus. Three different groups. Um, the leaving group with this, this R sub L. That's just a that's just a kind of a little placeholder that means this is a leaving group. This will actually be important, and we'll talk about what the leaving group does and how that's important. Um, this is just an example of an organic phosphorus nerve agent. Uh, what do you know? It looks about the same. And then we have the carbonates, uh, which don't they don't have a phosphorus, but rather they have a carbon a carbon atom, uh, more or less in place of the phosphorus. I'm not going to talk about these too much. Uh, the toxicity of the carbonates is it, it is a little different. It's it, they're not as toxic as a weaponized agent. They're still toxic, but um, they have slightly different properties. So let's go ahead and take a look at the sarin, since this is what's all over the news. This, this is the big bad here. It's not a particularly complicated molecule. Um, what we have is I have the active part of the sarin, and this the sarin looks chemically like many other nerve agents. So I'm not going to go through the chemistry of every single nerve agent, because they work in very similar ways. But you can see here, um, the reason that we call them organic or organo is because they have carbon atoms in them. So I have carbon, I have uh, methyl groups here, CH3, I have carbon. Um, so we have carbon atoms in here, that makes it organic. And then the organic phosphorus always has a, a phosphorus atom. Um, and I'm not going to talk about this, I'll spend a whole lot of time talking about this, but this is really interesting. When you take just basic chemistry and you talk about Lewis, structure and, and predicting bonds, you know at some point that, that the looking at things simplistically fails miserably, and this is one of those those instances. Oh, it's going to just continue plaguing me, I guess. This is one of those instances. Um, if you look at phosphorus, uh, Lewis structure would only predict that phosphorus can make a, a, few, a few covalent bonds. But what we see here is I see five different bonds of phosphorus. And so what I have to do is I have to evoke something called quantum mechanics, where um, we say that the electrons exist in little probability clouds, and we can mix and match those probability clouds. We call that hybridization. We can hybridize these little clouds, and we can make these hybrid orbitals. And that allows us to predict that phosphorus can, in fact, um, have these, these five bonds, and we call that um, SP3D hybridization, where we take an S orbital, three P orbitals, a D orbital, we put them in a blender, we mix them all up, and then we get these these five bonds that can occur. And that's really all I'm going to go in there, but it's still kind of interesting and fascinating. And then I have a leaving group. The leaving group is important, and as you might guess by the name, what does it do? It leaves. It leaves, and it allows the substitution with something else. It's what we call a substitution reaction in chemistry. Um, this is really important. Um, in this case, in the case of sarin, it's, it's fluorine, uh, but it can be any of the halides, uh, 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 but fluorine, um, and we'll talk about some, some others. Um, I like this because generally, if you take chemistry, particularly organic chemistry, fluorine's a terrible leaving group, um, but not in sarin. Anyway, we'll keep going. All right. Um, I should say that uh, when you see this double bond of the oxygen here, uh, this generally means that the agent is pretty toxic when you have this double, um, this, these little lines just being the bond, the little bonds, the double bond is oxygen. This generally means it's pretty toxic. When you have something like diazinon, which is a very common insecticide here, uh, even in New Mexico, a lot of uh, insect killer sprays like that contain diazinon. Um, here's a diazinon molecule. You can see that it has that organic phosphorus compound. You have the phosphorus here, but instead of oxygen, you have a sulfur. These tend to be less toxic, and what happens is this is actually metabolized, and you can see that once it's metabolized in the liver, that, that sulfur is replacing for oxygen, and it's metabolized into this more toxic form. Okay, so enough of the chemistry. Let's talk about naming them. 
because these are really common names. You've probably heard these, the G and the V agents. So when we, we say the G series, all we mean, all that G means is that these are German. These are agents that were developed in Germany. And the first agent to be developed in Germany, of course, was Pavin. And so we call that GA because A is the beginning of the alphabet. And then Saren was next, so we call that GB. And then by the end of World War II, we had Solman, and we call that GD. That, that's all it means. And then the B series, uh, we'll talk about these. These are the newer prototypes. Uh, we don't really know what B means. It might, be, um, it might mean victory. Um, and we'll talk about these because these, these are very different from these and how they work. And there's going to be some specific implications for us as CMS providers and um, if, if there was an attack involving these agents. Okay, so let's compare them. All right, we have a big old table here. I want you to do more almost all of the table. We're just going to talk about Saren, and we're going to talk about VX. And what I want you guys to look at is I want you to look at the volatility here. And what, what I mean by volatility in chemistry is how quickly does something evaporate? That's a really easy way of looking at volatility. If you look at Saren, Saren has a volatility of 17,000 milligrams per cubic meter at 25 Celsius. So it it loves to evaporate. It evaporates very quickly. But look at VX. It has a volatility of about 10. What does that tell you? You have to think about that. Is VX even a gas when you say nerve gas? If it, if it doesn't dissolve, it, it, or not dissolve, but if it doesn't um, atomize, it doesn't evaporate, is it really a gas at all? Or is it kind of a thick liquid that doesn't like the kind of gas? Yeah, it's a liquid. Whereas sarin is pretty much a gas. So is VX even a nerve gas? Well, not really. So we talk about these nerve agents, we talk about the persistence, that is how long do they kind of stick around in the environment. Um, on top here I have VX, right here, and I have sarin here, VX here, and sarin here. So I have uh, 9 to 10 Celsius, so kind of a chilly winter day. And uh, look at VX, it has a persistence of about three days, so it's going to want to stick around in the environment for a significant amount of time. Is that, is, that a, is that something to be noteworthy when we talk about responding to an incident that may involve these agents? Well, absolutely, because the V agents are going to stick around, and they're going to be very persistent, whereas the G agents, like Saren, you're looking at you know, minutes to um, hours of persistence, so they're not going to be as persistent. Um, and then just a little bit about the clinical toxicology needs. So here I have diazinon. Uh, which is the insecticide, we spray that on wasps and things like that in our house. And then I have Pavlum, Serin, and VX. And so what I want to do is I just kind of want to look at, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take a look at the VX here and we'll compare that to diazinon. So when we talk about what kills you, we use the term um, LD or LC, 50%. And what that means is LD is a lethal dose. It's the dose that that if 50% of the population received this dose, they would, they would die. They'd have a good chance of dying. So we call it the lethal dose 50. Now, Diane, now um, if you look at VX, we don't really know what its LD 50% progestion is. Why? Because we've never gotten that far, right? Uh, we've never, we, we don't test this on human beings. Um, so we only have kind of an idea of its skin absorption. But it takes about 10 milligrams. Uh, of skin absorption, so tiny, tiny amount. 10 milligrams absorbed through your skin, and you have about a 50% chance of dying. Versus diazomon, you have to ingest 214 milligrams per kilogram. So let's just do some basic math. And actually, I'm not worried about it, so So you're looking at about 15,000 milligrams of diazomon, or 50% for uh, an LD50, versus VX. 10 milligrams. So that gives you an idea of just how much more significantly toxic the uh, weaponized agents are. All right, so contemporary times. So even though we quit actively producing them, we have lots of this stuff stockpiled. Lots of this stuff stockpiled, and many other countries have it stockpiled. And many, some of these countries may or may not have um, a dubious rationale for having those agents. 
and we're seeing that kind of play out in some of these areas around the world. And we've seen recent acts involving these agents. So just some notable uses of these. Um, these look looks like these were probably used in the um, Iran or the Iraq Iran War. Um, this dates back to the late, um, early the early to late eighties, about ten year period, um, where um, Iraq used uh, these these agents. Sarah likely one of them. Um, there was possibly some exposure during the Gulf War. They, they don't know that they were they were actually used uh, specifically against troops, but we, uh, we we bombed a lot of weapons depots, and so it is, it's conceivable that some of those agents uh, were in those depots and, and they got out, and there were some uh, inadvertent exposures like that that resulted from that. Uh, we really saw these Sarah in particular used in the mid nineties. It was actually used twice in Tokyo. Was a, was a cult in Japan that used it. Um, it was used once in 90, 1994. I'm going to talk about 95 because this was a big one. It was actually several people had these uh, had the agents on them and they mixed them in the subway and released the serum gas and we had lots of casualties. We had uh, 13 people dead, uh, 50 were severely injured, and a thousand or more that had less serious symptoms. Um, and of course, um, possible use in the current serum crisis, we're, we're reasonably confident that these agents were used. Who used them and, and, and the, the what and why and all that, I'm not sure of, but pretty confident use. So, should I care? And this is another thing we talk about. Should I care? They're so lethal, you're going to die anyway, right? That's another uh, argument. Well, let's go back to the 95 terrorist attacks involving serum. It was released in a fairly enclosed environment. Okay, so significant exposure. So you have 13 people die, 50 severely injured, and 1,000 or more with less serious kinds of symptoms. So what does this tell us? If there was a, a nerve attack. Is survivability possible? Absolutely, survivability is it's quite possible. So we can't just assume that everybody's going to die and there's not going to be a whole lot for us to do. Survivability is quite possible. All right. So bottom line, there's a significant risk of exposure. Survivability is possible, and it's something that we want to be thinking about, even though we don't see as much of it here in the United States. Okay. How do these agents work? Okay. So what they do is they deactivate an enzyme, an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. And what does what is acetylcholinesterase? Some poor, some anatomy physiology horror, horror stories coming back, right? So acetylcholinesterase is an enzyme that breaks down a substance known as acetylcholine. So when we talk about having a muscle contraction, if my brain wants to communicate to my body to do something. The signal leaves my brain, it goes down a nerve, and when it gets to the end of the nerve, the nerve, uh, depending on what area of the nervous system we're talking about, that nerve may release something called acetylcholine. That molecule then travels from one nerve to receptors that, that it activates. It activates that they're either what we call nicotinic or muscarinic receptors. The acetylcholine passes through the junction between the nerve and, and the tissue or maybe another nerve. But here's the problem. That acetylcholine activates those receptors, but those receptors stay activated until what happens? Until I get rid of the acetylcholine. So I have to have a mechanism of getting rid of that acetylcholine, breaking it down, and the way that the body does that is through an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase or cholinesterase. So what nerve agents do is they deactivate cholinesterase. So here's just a picture. This is a molecule of acetylcholine here. Okay. And what happens is, at the active site of our cholinesterase, um, I have two different sites. I have my anionic site and my esteric site. And the big words that I'm using aren't as important as kind of the bigger picture of what's going on. So don't, don't let this, this stuff confuse you too much. But basically what happens is acetylcholine is attracted to this cholinesterase, and this cholinesterase kind of holds it in place, and that allows the acetylcholine to be broken down. It's actually broken down to acetic acid and choline. So, what happens? Well, let's talk about that. So, I have a couple of other pictures here. So, this is what normally happens. We can get rid of that acetylcholine, we can take that impulse away, 
So here I have just a picture of what's kind of going on chemically. We'll, we'll kind of break it down a little bit. So here's sarin. So what sarin is going to do is sarin is going to come in. And that fluorine that we talked about earlier, that leaving group, is going to be able to leave. And that is going to allow that phosphorus to attach to this oxygen here in the esteric site. So what's going to happen is that nerve agent is going to come in and it's going to attach into this hysteric site. It's going to attach, and it is going to basically plug up this cholinesterase. So if that nerve agent is attached, can they see a choline come in to be attached? No, it can't. So guess what? The acetylcholine doesn't get broken down. The acetylcholine accumulates, continues to accumulate, it continues to keep those nicotinic and muscarinic receptors active. And what does that do? Well, that does lots of things. These receptors cause lots of things to happen. And you guys may be uh, familiar with the term sludge. We were talking about that in the EMT, uh, EMT intermediate or paramedic school. These are the signs and symptoms of too much acetylcholine. And this is what we call a cholinergic crisis or a cholinergic toxidrome, where acetylcholine accumulates, you can't break it down, because that nerve agent is bound to that cholinesterase. So it causes the sludge, which is what we're familiar with, the salivation, um, the lactation or lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI crisis, emesis. So basically, patients get really sticky, they have lots of secretions. In addition to that, we have some other things that happen. I'll go through that. We have the killer bees. So these are the bad things. These are really, really bad things, and these are things that kill a lot of patients who are exposed to nerve agents. We have what's called bronchorrhea, and bronchorrhea is just a big word that means I have lots of secretions in my respiratory tract, my lungs. So my lungs are filling up with secretions, and then I develop bronchospasm. I have spasm, and of course you guys see people and have asthma attacks and whatnot, um, have significant bronchospasm. They have difficulty exhaling, getting the air out, air trapping, um, significant respiratory distress. Um, these things tend to happen. And in addition to that, what tends to happen as the as the uh, overdose becomes more and more severe, the uh, heart rate will decrease. You'll develop bradycardia. Um, so you get really wet, really sticky. You have lots of secretions occurring in your lungs. Your lungs are spasming. You're having bronchospasm, and then your heart rate is increasing. Um, so it's pretty dramatic when you see somebody has significant toxicity. Um, so these are the killer things. Here we go again. This place is cursed. I'll blame. I've probably my computer, but I'll blame it on. Okay, so clinical assessment. So all these signs and symptoms. Are there some things, critical things that we can kind of look at to kind of guide us? Well, in 1995, what they used, they actually used um, the presence of something called meiosis. And meiosis is just a word that means constriction of the pupils. So your pupils get pinpoint. Um, which is another thing that any of the nerve agents can do, um, is one of the most common signs that that provider saw, and they actually used that as a method for differentiating mild from moderate exposures. If you had myosis, that means you had a more significant exposure than, say, somebody who had just very mild, like a little runny nose, a little tearing in their eyes. Um, so just a high yield assessment. So mild effects might just be a little runny nose, a little lacrimation, just some tears. Some unremarkable vital signs. Their blood pressure is good, their heart rate is okay, it's not very cardiac. And they don't have any airway or neurological compromise. <laughs> Once they develop that meiosis, that, that constricting the pupils, we consider them moderate, they need a little more aggressive treatment. And then anytime they have any neurological, neuromuscular, or respiratory compromise, we call them severe. Alright, so let's talk about treatment. Well, safety and decontamination. What do you guys think? Is the G or the B series going to be more significant when it comes to decontamination? The V series, yeah. The V series would become much more significant. Um, if somebody's been exposed to sarin, um, especially down here, you know, say during the warmer months, there may be a good chance that by the time you get there, decontamination won't really even be a concern. 
Whereas with your persistent agents, like your B agents, um, the decontamination can be much more of a concern. Uh, I'll say that the, the, the G agents have been typically the ones that are used more often in these terrorist attacks. They're a little easier to, a little easier to manufacture. Uh, they don't require all the technology that the V agents um, require. Um, and the V agents aren't, aren't um, traditionally thought of as a great terrorizing weapon. They're really good at what we call denying entry. Um, the reason that they thought of using V agents on the battlefield is they'd go off, and then you'd have this area that's contaminated by this liquid that stayed there forever, or for several days, and the enemy army couldn't move in because they'd have all this, this stuff contaminating the area. Um, whereas if you used a G agent, G agents are designed to kill lots of people, and then they dissipate rather quickly, and they don't inhibit the movement of, of armies so much. Um, so the, the, the G agents tend to uh, traditionally be the ones that we see used in these attacks. Uh, atropine. Atropine is going to be a very uh, important frontline medication. Atropine is what we call an anticholinergic. So it is kind of, think of it as an anti-acetylcholine type of medication. Um, it works to block that cholinergic response, that acetylcholine response. So atropine is really good at drying us out. It's really good at drying secretions out. And it's really good at increasing the heart rate. So this tends to be a frontline medication. You guys have heard of something called 2 pan fluoride or parlidoxine. We'll talk a little bit about that. Parlidoxine, uh, we traditionally say that it is a reactivator. It, it helps reactivate cholinesterase. Um, but that's not always the case, particularly with the weaponized agents. Um, diazepam or valium uh, for seizures. Okay, occasionally people have seizures with these nerve agents as they get hypoxic or as they have muscle um, contractions. Supportive care with your ABCs may have to take over their airway. And one thing that they don't often talk about are beta agonists. And remember, we said one of the killer bees is bronchospasm. So we may need to give them beta agonists as well, having significant bronchospasm. Um, even if they're intubated, you may end up having to either bag an evidence or uh, do it through an Okay, so atrophy. This is really surprising for me. Because typically when we talk about it, we talk about the nerve agent antidote kit or the NAC um, or the Mark I kit, you generally talk about giving yourself two milligrams of atropine or giving the patient two milligrams, a two milligram auto injector. Check this out though. When we talk about stabilizing patients overseas, particularly you know, organic, organic phosphorus uh, over the season, the insecticide, 40 milligrams or more during the stabilization period. Of atropine, not uncommon. Not uncommon. You get 40 milligrams or more. There are some reports of people requiring a thousand milligrams of atropine in the first day, and there are some reports of over of about 11,000 milligrams of atropine being required uh, during the care of patients with these problems. And that's not typo believer. That's 11,000 milligrams. That's pretty significant to think about. Um, and I'll actually source that because there's somebody in here who's like, nah, 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 I need to double check this. It's actually a, a book called Bull Frank's Toxicological Emergencies. Uh, 11,000 milligrams. That's impressive. Um, some other medications for uh, the, the medics that are here. There's a medication called glycopyrrolate. Uh, you typically don't see that used outside the hospital. It's used in, in, in surgery. So there's a drying, as an anticholinergic drying agent. Occasionally, we may have to use glycopyrrolate. Because with these really high doses of atropine, um, you can get CNS, central nervous system toxicity, and atropine can cause um, mental status changes, um, altered, altered level of consciousness, and so on. So we may end up having to go with things like level parlay when you use really, really high dose of atropine. Another agent is the uh, scopolamine, which has an atropine or what we call anticholinergic like effects, but scopolamine ten, ten, tends to be more toxic to the central nervous system. So we don't tend to use it. Um, bottom line here is atropine is going to be your frontline agent, and you may, with significant exposures, have to give a whole lot of it. So I just want to think about this. If we have something here in Las Cruces that mirrored, we'll say mirrored or parallel what happened in Tokyo back in '95. So you guys get called. We have 13 people who are dead, 50 people with severe signs and symptoms, and a thousand or more people uh, with less severe symptoms. And five or six thousand people that weren't 
anywhere near the attack, but saw it on the news, get a little concerned and start calling 911 from the ER. Imagine what your resource utilization is going to be like. If you have 50 people, and those 50 people may need dozens of milligrams of atropine, think about that. How much atropine do we have in the city of Las Cruces? Do we necessarily have enough to manage a significant um, incident? Possibly not. So that might be something you'll need to think about with incident command is, hey, can I get somebody to go to outlying places like El Paso, like Deming, TRC, um, to uh, obtain additional uh, medications if the system becomes overwhelmed? Okay, so how do we administer it? One to two milligrams for mild symptoms. And then uh, typically what happens is, uh, as you give, you would say we give two milligrams. You wait three to five minutes. If the patient is improving, you'll double that. So you start with two, you give them four. And in three to five minutes, you give them eight, and 16, and so on. You can double the dose every time. It is not uncommon to give infusions, continuous infusion of atropine, atropine ribs. The end points that you guys want to look at if you're having to give lots of atropine um, in EMS, the big things you want to look at, you want clear lung sounds, you want a heart rate of, of 80 or so, and a systolic blood pressure of at least 80. Those are the major endpoints that we're looking at. These are what we call um, signs or symptoms of, of appropriate atropinization. So you're not necessarily looking for normal quote unquote vital signs, you're looking for life sustaining vital signs. Um, and of course, don't forget the pediatric dose 0 0.02 milligram, milligram, which is pretty standard when you talk about pals. Okay, parlidoxy. It may reactivate cholinesterase. This is just another name. This is 2 pan, two -pan chloride. Uh, the problem is some agents will bind irreversibly to cholinesterase. In some agents, the longer they stay bound, the more permanent that is, and that is a process known as aging. Um, some agents age very quickly. For example, Solman, which is one of the G agents, one to two minutes, and you have uh, aging that has occurred. And so it doesn't matter how much Tupam you give to a patient um, that has been exposed to Solman after a couple minutes, the Tupam will not be effective. Um, some studies out of India actually indicate Tupam may not be effective at all, it may be potentially harmful, depending on the individual nerve agent that's used. So what's the take-home point here? The take-home point is nerve agents are diverse, and TUPAM may not be effective in all patients. So you may not see dramatic improvement with TUPAM. Um, typically, it comes in a 600 milligram auto injector. You know that. Uh, it also comes in, in a package, and if you read the package insert, the insert recommends a couple grams. You mix it in 100 milliliters and give it over about half an hour. It's a drink. And you may need to repeat that every few hours um, when you're giving uh, the two pan infusion. Okay, so disposition. This is really interesting. I thought this was rather kind of curious what happened here, or what can happen here. There are long term consequences, and they're not often discussed. So, of course, as you might guess, they're more neurological. And I just put a question mark here. And I the question mark is about PTSD, and I'll just kind of throw it out there and see what you guys think when it comes to PTSD. Uh, imagine that you have been exposed to an agent. You uh, end up having difficulty moving. Your lungs fill up with fluid. You have bronchospasm. Uh, you have secretions everywhere. You're incontinent of, of bowel, of urine. Um, and you're, you're basically helpless drowning um, in a pool of your own secretions. And imagine that you, you somehow managed to survive that. Do you think there might be significant long-term psychological problems associated with that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that if, uh, and hopefully it never happens, but if something terrible were to happen in this area, we need to expect that people that survive may experience long-term uh, problems. And what do you think about providers? You guys are providers. Um, it's likely that some of you probably never even seen somebody who's been exposed, even to organic phosphorus agent, insecticides. But it's a pretty dramatic thing to see these people that they're, they're, they're foaming out of the mouth, they're having seizures, they're having difficulty breathing. 
Um, seeing somebody in this condition can also be disturbing. Imagine seeing 50 or 100 people in this condition and your resources are, are significantly overwhelmed. This could be very stressful for the providers as well. Um, so let's talk about this. So some of the specific conditions. The, the thing that we're going to run into in EMS is that initial cholinergic crisis. And that initial crisis, believe it or not, can last a long time, particularly with some of these agents that you can have here in the United States. Um, there, there's, there's a report of a, a gentleman who um, mixed insecticides for a living in, in Massachusetts, and he actually overdosed on diazinol. He drank a bunch of it. And um, he was on a, an atropine infusion for a couple of weeks because diazinol is what we call a highly lipophilic agent. So what it does is it likes fat. Lipophilic means lipid. Of Philip means loving, fat loving. Um, so what happened was a whole bunch of diazinon went into his fatty compartment. And every it doesn't matter how fat or skinny you are, we all have fatty compartments in our body. And that agent stayed in those fatty compartments, and then over time it would kind of leak out. And so what happened was they'd stabilize the guy, and then you'd have this leaching of the agent and he'd deteriorate again. So they actually had him on infusions for the uh, a couple of weeks in the hospital, and if they stopped the infusions, he would go into another cholinergic crisis. Um, so that's where the, you know it's really easy to, to find out. Okay, that's where that eleven thousand milligrams made of atropine come from. Someone's on an atropine drip for this period of time. Then we have something called intermediate syndrome. So let's say you treat somebody, they get better, they go home, they're doing okay, and then a few days after. They start having this neuromuscular dysfunction. They have difficulty walking, breathing, neurological impairment, um, and they end up presenting back to the hospital. This can be kind of confusing. You know, like, What's going on here? Um, and that's something that you always want to have in the back of your mind. Has there been a past exposure to a nerve agent? Uh, generally, this results in a couple of weeks. And then you have this OPIDN, or what's called organo, I know. I hate that term. Phosphate, but it is what it is. It's in the textbook. So, so organophosphate induced delayed neuropathy. This this happens about a month after the initial crisis. This tends to cause some pretty severe chronic disabilities. We're talking about chronic pain, chronic neuropathies. Anyone here ever had sciatica or chronic back pain? You get that shooting pain down your legs. You get the pins and needles sensation. Those kinds of things. Um, and the OPICN, which is the it goes right along with this is the organophosphor is ester induced. So these the ester just means the chemistry of the agent, um, uh, neurotoxicity. This is also a chronic problem as well. Okay, so to kind of wrap it all up. Nerve agents go back many, many decades. This is not a new thing. It's been around for a while. They are frequently used for self-harm, okay? Frequently used for self harm and have seen contemporary use as a weapon of mass destruction mechanism. And they have been used in developed nations. Japan is a highly developed, highly technologically developed nation. Um, so there, there, there may be this, this kind of this inclination to go, oh, well, that's, that's something that happens in, in other countries, not here. You no, know, it can happen just as easily in developed nations. Um, so there are some major threats. And the major life threat for us is going to be that cholinergic crisis and those those killer bees, if you will. Uh, the good thing is there is a effective treatment. Okay. We have effective treatment, but you've got to realize that effectively treating these patients may be going beyond that nerve agent endocrine. It may be a little more forward thinking than going. You know what? This this patient has severe signs and symptoms. I need to, to get them somewhere where we have large amounts of atropine, we have critical care resources to take care of the patient. Um, and, and some of these go beyond um, what we often talk about. And then there are long-term sequelae or long-term consequences that we have to anticipate after patients have been discharged. Okay, so references there. Um, just so I can prove you guys, yeah, I actually did. Use some some valid sources of information. Uh, so let's see. I actually have a few minutes. I'm glad that I was able to 
kind of breeze through that because I, I, I just wanted to see if you guys had any specific questions. I would try to answer them. I can't guarantee it's an answer, but if you had any specific questions about this since it's all over the news and, and that, I'd be more than happy to try to try to answer it the best I can. Yes, sir. Well, interestingly enough, that isn't something that the, the cardiovascular effects of atropine um, in somebody who's non-nerve agent poison, the cardiovascular effects are actually pretty significant, as, as you guys know. And in fact, um, overdose on atropine is white substances can cause a anticholinergic syndrome, a hypertensive, tachycardic, really dry. We don't see that um, with significant nerve agent toxicities. Um, if they have a significant toxicity and you're giving them a large dose of atrophy, you don't see the, the profound cardiovascular effects. We do see those neurological effects can happen with, with larger doses of atrophy. Uh, any other questions? Well, I think we have a few minutes before the, the next uh, speaker comes in, four or five minutes, so we're going to break it. Thanks for being here. Thank you.